friends! Welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany where I have new videos every week about books and the geeky mom lifestyle. In today's video I'm going to be talking about all the books that I read in the month of September. September is over. We are headed into October. It is legitimately fall, which makes me so happy. Fall is probably my favorite season. I like spring as well, but fall is probably my favorite. And I have a lot of books to talk to you guys about today. Who's surprised? Probably nobody. One thing I will say about this month, and you might notice this if you pay close attention to my stats, is that while I only read one less book than I read in August, I read significantly fewer pages. So while it seems like the numbers are still quite as high, keep in mind there are some shorter works involved here. With that said, if you're new to my wrap-ups, the way that these work is I start by talking about all of my stats for the month, and then I talk about all the books that I read, starting with my DNFs and my lowest rated books, moving up to my highest rated books. Now one thing to be aware of is about half of these books I talked about in detail in my mid-month wrap-up. So for those books, I'm just going to be showing you what they are, telling you the star rating, and not giving a whole lot of detail. If you want to hear more about the books in my mid-month wrap-up, you can check out the video that is linked up above. With that said, let's go ahead and dive into my stats. In the month of September, I read a whopping 31 books for a total page count of 9,530 pages. That number does include my audiobooks. And I will just note that even though I read only one less book than I read last month, I read 2,500 pages less than I read last month, which Honestly, not surprising given the fact that I had kids starting school this month and it has been super busy and I launched a podcast. So also don't be surprised if a lot of my reading was audiobooks this month. A lot of my reading was audiobooks this month. In September, I DNF'd one book and 20 of the books that I read were either ARCs or books that were sent to me for review. Again, not a surprising number given the fact that I was really working hard at getting that neck alley arc list down and physical arc list down. I've got to say I probably stuck closer to my TBR this month than I ever have since starting booktube maybe. Yeah, I'm proud of myself but also excited to be able to do more mood reading again now that I'm kind of like getting things checked off the list. This month I did not have any rereads, I did not read any translated fiction, and I did not read any graphic novels. I did however read six books by indie authors. Five of those are indie romances, uh, or romances in some cases, as you will see. And like I said, I listened to a lot of audiobooks this month. Uh, in fact, 17 of the books that I read this month were via audio. Higher number than usual, a little more than half of my reading was audiobooks. Usually it's under half, but again, kids starting school, this is how things went. Six of the audiobooks that I listened to are what I term shelf, which means that they are books that I had physical copies of on my TBR shelf and I got them off my TBR via audio. And if you're wondering where those audiobooks are coming from, this month five of them were from my library, five of them were from Audible, and part of the reason for the high number is I'm trying to get through some of those Audible Escape titles before it goes away in November. If you didn't know, the Audible Escape romance add-on package will no longer exist come November, so we're all trying to scramble and read the ones that we really wanted to read in there. Two of my audiobooks were from Scribd. Two of them were audio influencer copies from Libro FM. They give me a small selection of audiobooks I can choose to download every month in exchange for talking about their service. If you guys are interested in checking out Libro FM, I do have a link down below that you can use. I think they do really great work. They're basically an alternative to Audible where you get a credit every month and you can get an audiobook and the proceeds of it go to support indie bookstores, which I think is great. Then two of them were audio review copies from the Penguin Random House Volumes app and one was an audio review copy from NetGalley. With that said, let's go ahead and talk about the age breakdown. This month I read 20 books targeted at an adult audience, 10 books targeted at a YA audience, and one book targeted at a middle grade audience. Again, those are not surprising numbers. I don't read much middle grade and this year I've definitely been leaning more heavily into adult literature than YA. In terms of publication date, I am very pleased at <laughs> my earliest date. I read a couple of classics this month, so the earliest date of publication for a book I read this month was 1811. We're like out of pre-1900s, that's pretty impressive. I read eight books total that were published prior to 2019, 
two 2019 releases and 21 2020 releases. Again, knocking out those review copies this month, guys. <laughs> There's a lot of them. And in terms of the diversity of the authors that I was reading from, I'm very pleased with how things are looking this month. In total, only 55% of the books that I read were written by white authors, which is down 4.5% from last month. And there's also a greater variety in the racial and ethnic backgrounds of the authors that I was reading from this month. So I'm happy with that. And then I had a significant jump in the number of books by queer authors that I read. In fact, this month, 32% of the books that I read were written by queer authors, which is an increase of 20 percent from last month. So very solid stats there. Moving on, let's talk about the genres I was reading. Unsurprisingly, my most read genre this month was romance. And in terms of specifics, two of those were contemporary romances, four of them were historical romances, and four of them were speculative romances. I also read a lot of fantasy. Seven of the books that I read were fantasy, three were sci-fi, three were poetry, in this case novels written in verse, which we will talk about, two horror, one contemporary fiction, one dystopian, one general fiction, one literary fiction, and one nonfiction. So nice variety this month, but heavy on my favorites, which are romance, sci-fi, fantasy. Lastly, let's look at the ratings. This was an interesting month because I think what you'll see is I have an unusual shape to my bell curve. I didn't have anything this month that I hated. There were some things that were disappointing, some things that were mediocre, a lot of things that were very good but may maybe had some quibbles with, and then a few things that I liked a lot but no favorites. And this is the second month running, guys. Okay, let's let's just look at these. This month I did not give out any one star ratings or one and a half stars. I did have one two star, three books got two and a half stars, four books got three stars, two books got three and a half stars, nine books got four stars, eight books got four and a half stars, four books got five stars, and this month I did not have any six star reads. And in my personal rating scale, a six star is what I give to a favorite of the year or a favorite of all time. This is my second month running with no six stars. However, I think I'm about to seriously break that streak because as I'm filming this, I'm currently in the middle of two books that have the potential to be favorites. So we'll see. I have high hopes for October. And a new stat I'm adding that I thought would be interesting to look at is my average rating for the month. And for September, my average rating was 3.9, which seems right because I had a lot of four and a four and a half star reads, a lot of books that were very, very good, but didn't quite hit that five star mark for one reason or another. Okay, with that said, let's go ahead and move on and talk about all of the books that I read, starting with my DNFs, my lowest rated books, and moving on to my highest rated books. This month, I did have one book that I DNF, and I got about 40% of the way into it, so I read a, a significant chunk of it. And I, I want to preface this by saying I think that I am not the audience for this book and I don't necessarily think it's a bad book but I think it was not a book for me. The book that I DNF'd this month was Smash It by Francina Simone. Guys, I really love Francina as a creator, as a YouTuber. This is the first time I've read anything by her and I was really excited for her because I know this is her first traditionally published book, which way to go Francina, that's amazing. Smash It is a YA contemporary that's supposed to be kind of a retelling of Othello. And, um, you know, why contemporaries are never my sort of go to genre are never really my go to genres. Although, I mean, I do like a good Shakespeare retelling. <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't know about a fellow, although this was not heavy on the retelling element of it, I can tell you. So just just to throw it out there, I don't know that I necessarily would have gravitated towards this if I didn't know who the author was. And so maybe I should have known, <laughs> but I really wanted to support her and give it a try. If you want to hear some more detailed thoughts, I do have a review on Goodreads. I didn't rate it. I just added it to my DNF shelf and I do have a review. I read almost the first half of it, so I had a lot to say. And this is the sort of thing that I think if I was a teenager, maybe I would have done better with it. The main character is not particularly likable. She's pretty selfish and self-involved and not a great communicator. And you know, she's a teenager and that can be how teenagers are. So I don't want to necessarily dock it for that. But I'll say for me, if I'm going to be reading that sort of book, especially in a contemporary setting at this point in my life, I kind of need something else that's really hooking me into the story and carrying me with it. And that was just not the case 
here. There were also a couple of things I had some concerns about that I think could have been handled a little bit better. But again, I'm not going to say too much more in here, but if you want to hear more of my thoughts, feel free to check out my Goodreads review. Unfortunately, this was not the book for me and I DNF'd it. So that was a bummer. This is always one of those things that's really hard when like you know and have met the author of a book, but yeah. So there you go. Moving on, I had one book that I gave two stars this month and this, I don't, I don't know. This I think was a case of me really not getting along with the writing style and the structural choices that were made. I think there were some very cool ideas here, but I, I just didn't enjoy reading it, which is unfortunate because it looked really cool. This was a Tor.com novella. It's called Burning Roses by S.L. Huang. So I had read another book by this author previously and enjoyed it but didn't love it stylistically and it was a very very different sort of book. The other book that I read from her was a very actiony kind of spy military type thriller and there were things that I really liked about it. I think I, I enjoyed that one more certainly much more than I, than I enjoyed this one. This on paper seemed like something I should really like. It's a mashup of fairy tale retellings, some of which are from the traditional English canon, and one which is a Chinese fairy tale. The two main characters are middle-aged queer women. That was why I requested this one on NetGalley, because I thought it would be really, really great. Unfortunately, I loved the ideas, and there were certain parts of it that I thought were interesting or clever, but stylistically, the writing didn't really work for me. It felt like a weird mashup of that sort of like military thriller writing with trying to write a fairy tale and it felt kind of jarring like I'm not sure the tone quite worked all the time or worked consistently. That was kind of an issue for me. The other thing is that it's set up with this framing device and I never really liked the framing device. I didn't feel very connected to the characters through it. I didn't like structurally the way it was handled. And sometimes the stories within the framing device I enjoyed more. But this is the kind of thing where I think if you enjoy the author's voice and get along with the style of writing, you'll probably really love this. Unfortunately for me, I that didn't work and it made it not such a positive experience. I like the project and the idea of this. But yeah, for me, this was two stars. It wasn't terrible. There were redeeming qualities to it, just not really for me. So that was kind of a bummer. Oh, oh my gosh. I hate this so much. <sighs> okay, then I had two books that I gave two and a half stars. Both of them were Eorks from Neck Alley, and both of them <sighs> were just disappointing. They were books that had things that were great about them, but it they, they didn't come together in one way or another, or something kind of fell flat. And yeah, it was the, okay, I, I'm sad about both of these. <laughs> okay, so the first one is Never Look Back by Lilium Rivera. This is another one that had a really, really cool concept, but the execution was weird. And I, and the marketing, there were just, there were choices made in this that, I, that didn't work. And I was reading other reviews, and I think I'm not the only person who felt this way. In some ways, this felt like two separate books. The first half of the book has a certain flavor to it, and the second half is completely different and not in a way that worked. It was strange and very jarring. And I think if it had picked one of those things, I would have been fine with it, but it felt like it had all these ideas and was just gonna smash them all together in this one book, and it, it was too much and it didn't end up working. It's a YA modern retelling of the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice from Greek mythology, which is a really, really cool idea. It centers kids of color, it's set in New York City, and the heroine is from Puerto Rico and she's dealing with trauma from a hurricane, maybe some mental health things are going on, and there's like a magical realism element to it which was really cool and it was using things as a metaphor for larger issues and I was like yeah this is great I'm loving this and then about halfway in it gets really weird and takes a turn into the much more directly magical and yeah the combination didn't work for me like I think if it had been this creepy weird magical thing from the beginning that could have worked for me or if it had stayed more magical realism all the way through it would have worked for me but it kind of smashed two things together and felt like two different books and 
yeah, I don't, I don't know. It was, it was interesting. So this is another one where a lot of the writing was really beautiful. It had a lot of great ideas. I liked the way it was trying to talk thematically about really serious issues, but it didn't come together the way I wanted it to. So I ended up giving this one two and a half stars, which was unfortunate because it, it's the kind of thing where I'm like, if this had been done a little differently, it could have been like four or five stars, but <sighs> when you want a book to be something <laughs> other than what it is, this happens sometimes. Then I also very sadly ended up giving two and a half stars to Well Played by Jen DeLuca. Oh my gosh, I know guys, I know. It's the sequel to Well Met, which was my favorite romance of last year. <laughs> I had such high hopes for this book. Oh my goodness. And it wasn't the most terrible thing. There were things about it that were done well. I still really enjoyed the Renaissance Fair elements of it. And so I'll continue on in the series because I love that part of it. The Corsa Tree and the Ren Fair atmosphere. I love all of that and the ambiance. I also thought that the character development of the heroine was pretty good and we get a lot of in-depth development of her. However, and this is a big however, that completely kind of messed up my experience of reading the entire book and made it drop to two stars. There were two big issues I had with this. Number one, the structure and pacing of this is really weird. The first 40% of the book, the only interaction between the hero and heroine is via emails and text messages. And this is connected to my second big issue, which is the fact that the hero was basically catfishing her for an entire year. So that's what's taking place in the first 40% of the book. And that was never really adequately dealt with. And then he does another thing later on in the book and like kind of apologizes via email. I was like, okay, well maybe it'll sort of redeem itself and we'll get some big grovel and grand gesture. But no, the heroine does a grand gesture. And I was like, no just no. So, so I was not rooting for the romance. I didn't enjoy reading the first 40% of the book. I don't know what happened, but I'm going to read the third book in the series and hopefully it will be kind of back to what it was. I loved Well Met, but yeah, this just was very disappointing. That was, that was a disappointing one. I had such high hopes for it. Oh well. Oh no. I had three two and a half star reads. Oh my god. Ah! The other one was so disappointing too. Guys, this was like the month of things that I really expected to love that were really disappointing. So the third book I gave two and a half stars to was The Orphan of Cemetery Hill by Hester Fox. Look, I loved her first two books. They were both like four and a half or five stars. Great gothic romances. I was so excited for this one and I just didn't like it. I... I didn't like the hero. He wasn't great. I was never rooting for the romance. I also I also think this one was trying purposefully probably to get away from just being in this isolated small town and had part of the book where they went to the UK. That didn't work for me. I didn't want that. I wanted the gothic isolated feeling. I didn't want it to go other places and so that I wasn't a fan of. And there were some moments that were major deuce ex machina moments where highly unlikely things happened for plot reasons and because I already wasn't really sucked into the romance or into the plot and wasn't liking what it was doing I couldn't just go along with those things like I might have in another scenario so yeah this one I wasn't a fan of it was disappointing two and a half stars I did really love her first books and I will try whatever she puts out next year but yeah I wasn't a fan of this so if you can't tell my disappointments all came in the second half of the month. I actually had a really really great first half of the month. Then I read all of these books that I was thinking oh they're gonna be so good and so yeah some major disappointments there. But that said let's go ahead and move on to my three star reads. This month there were four of them and I didn't talk about any of those in my mid-month wrap-up either. I'm telling you guys <laughs> my mid-month wrap-up was all like four stars and up. <laughs> And then the second half of the month happened. It's fine. Um, three stars is good. Like, it's not a bad rating. It's just, you know. Okay, and so first in three star reads, guys, I have a couple of erotic romances that are very out there to talk about that I decided to read because the hype was real. Perhaps the most bizarre and the shortest one that I just have to tell you about because if you have a dark sense of humor, 
it's only 16 pages and you might laugh at it. I laughed a lot. Some people seem to hate it, but I thought it was horrible, so bad it's good kind of thing that made me laugh a lot. And that is the erotic romance that is taking over Twitter, Kissing the Coronavirus by MJ Edwards. Now you might be thinking, I never thought I would hear coronavirus and erotica in the same sentence. Neither did I, but I saw it all over Twitter. Somebody tweeted saying it was only like 16 pages long and I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this. You guys, it's so badly written, so badly written, but it's self-aware about how bad it is. It's clear that the author knows that it's very, very poorly written. It's kind of like a tongue in cheek thing. And so if you have a darker sense of humor and you can just like laugh at how bad it is, you might enjoy it. People are like, how did you give this thing three stars? Look, here's the deal. Writing quality, one star. Self-aware entertainment value, five stars, hence the average <laughs> of three stars. So I'm giving three stars to kissing the coronavirus. It's terrible, but like also hilarious. If you don't want to subject yourself to the entire thing, I did pull a few choice quotes for my Goodreads review. So you're welcome. <laughs> enjoy that. <laughs> I also decided since earlier in the month, as we'll talk about, I had had a first outing with Ruby Dixon that went well. I thought, well, let me try the thing that she's really known for while I have it available on Audible Escape, which is Ice Planet Barbarians. <laughs> Guys, I know there's a lot of love for this series and you know, I didn't hate it. Would I go out and read more of it? No, probably not. I will probably try some other things from her that I think might be more up my alley. I think just trope wise, this is less my cup of tea, but it was somewhat entertaining to read at least as a one-off. So you might be wondering what this is. It's another erotic romance that is, it's very out there guys. It is <laughs> very strange, but again, I think self-aware about its strangeness. The main character is a woman who gets kidnapped by aliens and then she and these other human girls end up crash landing on this ice planet where there are alien barbarians who mate with them. And it's, I mean, it's so out there and so over the top. I don't want this video to be demonetized, so I'm not gonna go into detail, but it, it, it was something else. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I did that. I didn't hate it. I, I just think this is probably not the series for me in general, which is fine. More power to those of you who are fans. Let me just say, if you wanna know more, again, my Goodreads review is linked down below and I think I go into a little more detail there than I wanted to on the video, but I'll just say that some of the alien anatomy might not make a lot of sense in terms of biological function, but does work very well <laughs> for like the sake of human female pleasure. So it's, it is very out there. It's not going to be for everyone. One thing to be aware of though, is there is kind of a trigger warning for early on in the book. We see another girl get raped by the aliens that kidnapped them. Not the aliens on the ice planet. It's a different species of alien, but it's a little jarring if you're not going in expecting it. After that, the consent is like reasonably good, but just FYI. I also gave three stars to Crimson Minds by Patrick D. Kaiser. This is an indie paranormal thriller written in verse that was sent to me by the author. This was his first self-published work. So thank you to him for sending it to me to read. This was a little bit of a mixed bag for me. On the one hand, it was a very quick read due to it being told in verse. It like didn't take very long to read. I liked the ideas behind the world. There were some cool things involving psychic warfare. Basically, this is set in an alternate version of Chicago where psychic gangs are battling for control of the city. And this teen boy who's a powerful psychic is trying to find out who killed his father and sister. So it's really interesting conceptually and the world is cool. I think in ter terms of it being told in verse. There were times when it worked pretty well and the prose flowed nicely and you kind of got the story. There were other times though when I feel like the emphasis was more on trying to fit a rhyming scheme than necessarily it always making sense or fitting with the narrative. Additionally, while I liked the plot that we got, I wanted more 
from it. And so I think maybe if some of the poetry elements of it had been trimmed down in terms of kind of the excess parts of it, bulked up the explanatory parts of it, and included a little bit more plot in this first book, I probably would have liked it more. That said, I think it's a good first outing for a self-published author, and I do have one of his newer books on my TBR for October, so I'm interested to see how his work has evolved in terms of polishing his craft. So thanks to the author, three stars for Crimson Minds. If you guys want to check it out, um, there are an entire trilogy that completes the story and they are all available. And it was a very, very quick read. It did not take me long because of the fact that it's told in verse. Then the final book that I gave three stars to this month was Bringing Down the Duke by Evie Dunmore. <laughs> What's funny, as you will see, is that I actually read this series in reverse. I had an e-arc of her second book and clearly ended up liking it better than the first book. I read the first book second. This was okay. I really like the fact that it's a somewhat more feminist take on a historical romance. I like the fact that it's set during the suffragette movement and you're getting more history in it. Although I will say you get more history in book two, which might have been part of why I liked it better. Plus I just, I liked the romance better. I didn't love the hero in this book. I'm not sure I really saw the appeal of him for our heroine. There were things that I liked about this and things that were funny, but I was never fully on board for the romance, so three stars. With that said, let's move on to my three and a half star reads. This month there were two of them, and one of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. That book was The Roommate by Rosie Dannon, and if you want to hear my thoughts on that, check out my mid-month wrap-up. I also gave three and a half stars to Vampires Never Get Old, edited by Zoretta Cordova and Natalie C. Parker. This is a YA anthology of short stories with a somewhat fresh take on vampire mythology since vampires are really big right now. I liked what this book was trying to do. I mostly had a good time with all of the stories and really liked a couple of them. Others were fine and enjoyable to read. It's not something I would steer people away from. I think if you like vampire stories this is a fun easy way to get a little bit of vampire fiction from a variety of different perspectives in. And I did like the fact that after each story there was a couple pages of one of the editors being in conversation with the themes that that story was playing with. I thought that was really interesting and cool to kind of explore what are some of the problems with the way that we've approached vampire stories in the past and how do we grapple with that. And I liked the attempt at being more inclusive in terms of things like race and gender and gender identity and sexuality and ability. Sometimes that was done really well, sometimes it was fine. If you want to know more details, check out my Goodreads review. I have some content warnings in there and things that you might want to be aware of, but ultimately I ended up giving this one three and a half stars. All right, moving on, let's talk about my four star reads. This month there were nine of them, a lot of four star reads. Five of them I read in the first half of the month. Three of those are in my mid-month wrap-up, and two of them were books that I talk about in more detail in my vlog where I swapped TBRs with Mara from books like Woe. So I will tell you what the five books are and where you can find each of them. First up I gave four stars to Sanctuary by Paula Mendoza and Abby Schur, and I talked about that one in my mid-month wrap-up. Then I gave four stars to Cranford by Elizabeth Gaskell, and I talk about this one in that reading vlog. Also four stars and in that reading vlog was My Life in France by Julia Child. And then two more that I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up, Wayward Witch by Zaretta Cordova and Gold Wings Rising by Alex London. If you want to hear about those books in more detail, check out those two videos. I also gave four stars to A Reaper at the Gates by Saba Tahir. This is book three in the series. I think book four got pushed back to December, but it is still coming out soon, and I've been doing the read-along with Penguin Teen, really enjoying them. This was my first time reading Reaper at the Gates, and I had a really good time with it. I will say one thing about Reaper at the Gates is it's very, very clearly a setup book for the finale. It's doing a lot of things in the single book, kind of setting up pieces and dominoes to get knocked down in the finale. That I think is very clear, which does mean that it can feel a little bit messy or all over the place at times, but the character development is still there. It's really fantastic. The world building is really good. I'm loving the story. I'm loving where she's taking things. There were twists and reveals that I didn't see coming that were shockers and super well done. And I continue to love the fact that Sabatir does not pull her punches. She will put her characters through hell and you don't know what she's going to do. And I don't know how the last book is going to end. And I love it. I love it when stakes are really high, when things do get a little bit darker. So do know going in. This is a fairly brutal and dark series, but it's very, very well written, and I 
think more people should give it a try. I'm super excited to read the final book and see how everything ends up and where she takes things. I'm pretty positive she's gonna kill somebody off and break our hearts because I feel like that's what she would do, but yeah, I love it. Also, if somehow the people at Penguin Teen or Sapa to Hear ever see this video, please, 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 can we have a novella about the Commandant? Because I need more of the Commandant. We need like a novella or something. What Ferris was to the Lunar Chronicles, we need the same thing for the Commandant in the series. I'm just saying who's with me. Then I also gave four stars to A Rogue of One's Own by Evie Dunmore. Like I said, I did really enjoy the second book a lot better than the first one. What's interesting about this one is I don't think the hero or heroine, either of them are necessarily likable characters all the time, but it works because I think it's this like beautiful story that upends typical gender tropes in these sorts of romances. And, you know, unlikable people need love too. I really liked what this was doing. It is on the longer end for a genre romance and some people might not like that. There's a lot more plot and a lot more history that gets put into this one, but I enjoyed all of those elements. I was happy to read them. And I kind of loved that we have this very prickly heroine who inhabits some of the tropes that you more often see in men in these types of books. Frequently you'll have a hero who I'll steal the phrasing from my friend Mara books like whoa because I think this kind of gets the idea across pretty well is that you'll often have a hero who has pants feelings but can't admit that he has heart feelings and in this case you have a heroine doing the same thing which is really interesting so I liked this a lot I gave it four stars I don't know that everybody will like it as much as I did but I thought it was a pretty good time. I also gave four stars to The Death of Vivek Oji by Akweke Amezi. And honestly, this is the sort of book that is always really difficult for me to rate because it's a book that's really well written and accomplishes what I think the author is setting out to do, but also wasn't necessarily the most enjoyable thing to read all of the time because of the content. I am really happy I read this. I've been meaning to read from Akweke Amezi for a long time and I can see why their books get so much critical acclaim. This is literary fiction set in Nigeria that's using a mystery as sort of the engine of the plot, but don't get it wrong. It's really not a whodunit. It's more of a literary character study communal communal character study I guess you could say in some ways. Vivek was born as the son of a couple. Their dad was Nigerian, their mom was Indian, and at the beginning of the story Vivek's body shows up on the family's doorstep and the rest of the book is basically going back and exploring what happened, relationship with all of these people around him from family and friends and people in the environment. And I will say it's pretty impressive how much is packed into this book. It's not a very long book but there's so much depth and meaning packed in here and every word choice feels intentional. On just a prose level the writing is really beautiful and the story is haunting. It's something that I think will stick with you for a long time. It's something that you'll be thinking about for a long time. At least I know I will. However it's a difficult one to read and I'm still not sure how to feel about some of the stuff that it's doing here. On the one hand I like thematically the fact that it's tackling issues of gender and gender identity, toxic masculinity, familial expectations and the burden of that, and religiosity and what it's like to grow up in a society that is not accepting of difference. So there's a lot thematically that this is unpacking. But you should be aware going into this there are some things that some people just aren't going to want to read because it's in there and even if you do read it it's difficult. Those things include the fact that there is a sexual relationship between cousins in this book so there is a kind of incestuous relationship and it's it's not a relationship that's necessarily looked at negatively. I would say it's largely viewed as positive or bittersweet at least. There are also a lot of characters cheating including cheating on the page on spouses, on significant others, there is a lot of that. There's a lot of messiness and you see that graphically happen. So just FYI, among other things, it's not a light book. There's also homophobia and this is dealing with the violence that can often be inflicted on the bodies of trans or non-binary people. It's, a, it's doing a lot. I mean, it's beautifully written but I, I still don't know how I feel about all of it, so I gave it four stars. Um, 
I, I am glad that I read it though. And then the final book that I gave four stars this month was The Space Between Worlds by Micaiah Johnson. This was a really interesting book and I loved what it was doing thematically, even if it wasn't always perfect in the way that it tackled things. It's a debut sci-fi novel in which there are parallel universes and the main character is a woman who works for a company traveling to parallel universes to get information basically to make them money. The trick is that even though there are almost 300 alternate worlds that they know of that they can travel to, you can only travel to that alternate world if your alternate self is dead. So the reason that our main character is so valuable is that she is dead in all but like 11 or 12 maybe of the alternate worlds and can travel to many of them. But the reasons for this are that she is a person of color who grew up in a poor and dangerous area and often died from the violence in her neighborhood or died because of bad nutrition or bad parenting by her mom or died for various other reasons. And so what's interesting about this is that it's exploring inequality of race and class and socioeconomics and how those things inform our sense of identity and the choices that we make. There is also a sapphic relationship in this book. So if you're looking for that representation. Our main character is bisexual or pansexual. The language is not used on the page, but she does have romantic relationships with men and women in the book. I loved the way that it was using this to think about these larger issues. I generally liked the plot, even if it wasn't perfect. If you want to hear more sort of detailed thoughts, I do, as always, have a Goodreads review for this one. But I liked it. I think it's a really strong debut. I'm curious to see what else we get from this author, and I gave this one four stars. Next, I had eight books that got four and a half stars, and five of them I have previously talked about in other places. First up, I gave four and a half stars to The King's Spinster Bride by Ruby Dick. Dixon. This is the other Ruby Dixon I read this month and this is a book I talk about in more detail in my TBR swap vlog so if you want to hear more of my thoughts check out that video. Then four of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. Those books are Before the Ever After by Jacqueline Woodson, White Fox by Sarah Faring, Everybody Looking by Candace E. Lowe, and Stealing Thunder by Alina Boyden. If you want to hear about any of those books, check out my mid-month wrap-up. I also gave four and a half stars to Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen. This was the Patreon book club pick for the month, and I really enjoyed this a lot. It made me laugh, and I'm super glad that I decided to revisit this. I think I may have read this when I was a teenager and didn't love it, but this experience was a really, really positive one. You have to like Jane Austen's writing, and as we saw in the patron live show, not everybody does love her writing, but I do, and so this worked for me. There were things that I just thought were hilarious reading it now as a 30-something as opposed to as a teenager. For instance, the fact that Marianne goes on about how 35 is so ancient and you could never have a passionate experience or relationship with anybody when you're 27 or older because you're too old and I don't know it just had me kind of laughing the tongue-in-cheek humor worked for me and I think as a teenager who thought 35 was pretty old I probably wouldn't have gotten all of it. I also just think that Jane Austen is so good at writing characters who feel like people you've probably met in the real world and reading this I'm like yeah humanity hasn't changed all that much. <laughs> I really enjoyed this a lot. I gave it four and a half stars. It's not my favorite book of hers, but I did have a good time with it and I'm glad that we read it. I also gave four and a half stars to The Original by Brandon Sanderson and Mary Robinette Kowal. This was really cool. It was an audio first novella that was co-written by those authors and I got this as an audio arc from NetGalley. I was very into this. It's basically a sci-fi mystery set in this futuristic world where everything has kind of gone digital and the main character is a woman who wakes up not remembering the last night of her life but being told that she is actually a clone of herself because her original had murdered her husband and now she has to go and track down her original and bring her to justice. And it's really good. I thought it was really fun and inventive. I was so into it. The audiobook was done very cool. It has great sound effects that work with what's happening in the story. It was so well produced. I would highly recommend checking this one out if that appeals to you. And it's not very long. I think it's like three, three and a half hours at regular speed, something like that. It was very brief, but like really, really fun. I loved it. Lastly, I gave four and a half stars to The Bone Shard Daughter by Andrea Stewart. 
This was sent to me for review from the folks over at Orbit. So thank you to them. This is available now if you guys want to check it out. And I really liked this a lot. It's a debut fantasy that's really unique in terms of the setting and the world building. And I was super into it. I think it's a very impressive debut. One thing to know about this is it's multi perspective, you're following the perspectives of several different characters. And so you have to be ready for a little bit of a slower pace in terms of the plot getting going. But if you like that, and you can go along with kind of slowly getting to know the world and the characters and the magic system, it's really good. And it's a great, interesting, complex cast of characters. There's also a pretty great established sapphic relationship amongst two of the perspective characters. And instead of it being about them getting together, it's about the complications of their relationship as it is and whether they'll be able to stay together given their differences. The magic is really interesting. It's got kind of a technical quality to it and it's spoilery so I can't talk too much about it but I think thematically the things this is playing with are interesting and unexpected given the genre. If you want to hear more of my spoilery thoughts on that, I think I put a spoiler section in my Goodreads review, which you can check out. Really enjoyable, epic fantasy. It's set in a nation made up of islands, which is a little bit different. And it's dealing with themes of colonization and identity and inequality. There's a lot here and I'm very excited to see more from this author. I definitely want to read on to see what happens. It kept my attention kept me sucked in. I had a few minor quibbles with it, which is why it wasn't five stars, but in general, really good, very strong debut, four and a half stars. Finally, this month I only had four books that got five stars and three of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap up or in that vlog. So I only have one more book to talk about. That's wild. I usually would have more five stars, but you know. First, I gave five stars to Clean Sweep by Alona Andrews. I really loved this. And this is one that I talk about in more detail in that TBR swap reading vlog. So if you want to hear more about that, go check out that video. I also gave five stars to When No One Is Watching by Alyssa Cole and Majesty by Catherine McGee. If you want to hear my thoughts on either of those books, check out my mid-month wrap up. So the final book we're going to talk about in this video today and my final five star read is The Heiress Effect by Courtney Milan. I really liked this a lot. I just think Courtney Milan's writing is so fantastic on a prose and technical level. It's so high quality, which I think is unusual for historical romances. And look, like I enjoy historical romances. I don't necessarily always need the quality to be super, super high to find it enjoyable. But if that's what you're looking for, you might check out Courtney Milan. The other thing I love about her books is that she doesn't erase the existence of people of color in her historicals because surprise <laughs> there were people of color around and so one of the heroes in the story because it's two romances sort of for the price of one is from India so I thought that was pretty cool. This one was hilarious it made me laugh so much. The antics of the heroine had me in stitches. I was rooting for both of the romances. I loved the characters and the exploration of various themes of what was happening there I just liked it a whole lot. I am quickly becoming a big fan of her work. Okay, so there you go. I feel like I've been talking for a very long time and I have to edit this video, but those are the 31 things that I read in the month of September. It's been a really interesting month, but I had a lot of really strong things that I read and I'm proud of how closely I was able to stick to my TBR as well because I am not always able to do that. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about today. And for your question of the day, tell me something about how you rate your books in terms of enjoyment versus quality. Something like Quake and Mezzi, sometimes I was really sucked in by the beautiful writing. Sometimes I was very, very uncomfortable and it was difficult to know for sure how to rate it. And so I kind of combined my experience with the quality of it and came up with four stars. But how do you tackle books like that where you're like, I don't know if I loved the experience of reading this, but objectively it was very good and I'm going to be thinking about it. Is that like a five star read? Is that a three star read? How do you, how do you tackle it? Let me know in the comments down below. If you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.